Welcome back to another Innovation Business and Law Center uh, fall speaker uh, series, sorry, spring speaker series. Um, just as a general reminder, in uh, a couple of weeks, on March 4th, we're going to host Kyle Fry, who's the Assistant General Counsel for Kent Corporation, and he's the chair of the Iowa State Bar Association Innovation Committee. And he's got some really interesting ideas. He's a great person um, here to talk about, particularly about the state of practice in Iowa. Um, and then in uh, a few more weeks, we're going to have Professor Kat Moon, who's the director of the Innovation Design, uh, the director of Innovation Design for the Program on Law and Innovation at Vanderbilt Law School, and she's going to be talking about what she calls the Delta Model, which are lawyer competencies in the fourth industrial age. So that's going to be a really, really neat talk as well. Um, so today, though, I'm thrilled to introduce Professor Bill Henderson, uh, one of the most, if not the most, influential voice in legal education. So since receiving his JD in 2001 from my alma mater, the University of Chicago, Professor Henderson has been a change agent in legal education, publishing articles like Blueprint for, for Change, explaining how law schools should retool legal education, authoring numerous cover articles for the ABA Journal and American Lawyer, and digging into the legal profession's lack of diversity. Um, he's been recognized in the National Law Journal's list of 100 most influential lawyers in America, which is a list only about once every decade. Um, and he's founded legal education nonprofits and legal analysis companies. Uh, he also edits the blog Legal Evolution. So today he's going to be talking about the future of law and what it means for all of you. So I'm going to turn it over to Professor Henderson. Thanks, Thank thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you, University of Iowa uh, College of uh, Law. It's been a wonderful uh, visit. I've loved every minute of it so far. And uh, uh, looking forward to, to, to giving this uh, talk, which is the first time I've given this particular talk called One to Many Legal uh, Solutions. So uh, I want to begin by, uh, by being clear. I'm going to be talking a lot about data and models, but it all devolves back to people. And these are lawyers that I uh, know that are in practice. And let's face it, they're pretty young. They, compared to me, they're young lawyers. And so I, I, uh, for the students in the audience, I want, the, I want to know that this connects back to your uh, future. And uh, although it looks daunting here, uh, there's a path uh, uh, forward here. And I'll circle back to, to Jason Alma and Eric, who are kind of, a, uh, kind of will round out my story. So when I'm talking about one-to-many solutions, uh, I, uh, I'm grafting off of a lot of other uh, 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 innovation thinkers, particularly Richard Susskind, who's written a series of books. He's a futurist lawyer, technologist, consultant, uh, professor, educator in the UK. And he's written a series of books after getting his PhD in the UK on artificial intelligence and law in the 1980s. Uh, he's gone out and kind of continued to focus on that, uh, on that uh, uh, issue, and he talked about the transition from one-to-one -one consultative ser services, which is the, the paradigm that's in our head that gets ins that's, that's installed by prof culture, and to some extent, uh, the, the paradigm we use to educate lawyers, and it's, there's a, it's a perfectly good uh, paradigm. It's coherent, uh, but there's coming into being a new one-to-many uh, uh, model uh, that is very different, and uh, I won't call it disruptive because it's, it's happening at such a pace that some people feel comfortable to ignore it, but it's definitely coming and it's integral uh, to function in the future of the uh, legal uh, uh, profession. So one to many solutions are products and services, a mix of products and services uh, that scale uh, legal solutions uh, primarily to deal with issues of productivity. So we can, so we're, if we can drive up quality and we can drive down per unit costs so more people can access legal solutions. That's the, that's the nature uh, of it. Uh, so here's some of Richard's work uh, where he talked, and this is a, a, something that came from his book, The End of Lawyers, and then was reprinted again in uh, 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 Tomorrow's Lawyers. End of Lawyers sounds very foreboding, like he's predicting the end of lawyers, but it's actually end of lawyers question mark, and he's asking the question, what's the purpose of lawyers? The purpose of lawyers is, is to serve clients and to facilitate the needs of society and maintain and enhance and spread rule of law. That would be Richard's uh, uh, definition. And he said that we're on a journey from bespoke legal services, which is definitely one-to-one -one consultative legal services, uh, to a standardized, to systematized, to productized, to eventually commoditized. Uh, we know uh, if you started the profession 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we already had begun standardization. These are four books in the library. 
which I can remember my second uh, year as a summer associate, somebody put an informal book in front of me and said, oh my god, <laughs> look at all these contracts. Uh, that, uh, that, that, and they're annotated and they're educated. I had no idea that, 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 that oftentimes contracts were beginning to become standardized, at least within the firm, and then eventually uh, within practice segments, and then eventually the ABA practice uh, sections getting uh, involved. And so, uh, but systematized would be, we're moving along the, uh, the idea of decision trees, eventually productized, like a TurboTax problem. Uh, and this all sounds good until we get to commoditize, which is free over the internet. And that seems to wipe away, wipe away our ability to, uh, uh, to make a living, or it would be something that, that we would have a difficult time coping with. And so when lawyers, when Richard used to give these talks, uh, this is going back 15 years ago, and I was there seeing how lawyers reacted to it, everyone said, no, 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 no. My practice area is bespoke. It's very specialized. The technology uh, can't find recurring patterns to it. Uh, it stays bespoke. Our muscle memory is to go into, into kind of the flight to complexity. And so we, we want to do the most specialized uh, areas where we think, well, that's always going to be bespoke. We don't need to change. Uh, we can make a, a high living by staying there. Uh, but Richard is, it points out that actually there's tremendous economic opportunities. You move along, the, and first of all, your clients are pulling you in this direction because they don't want to pay for heart surgery when they can be basically on a health regimen. So, and so that, uh, that, that that's the kind of thing you can get when you move along this continuum, eventually getting into preventative uh, legal care. Uh, but Richard pointed out that if you go down this journey, as your clients are pulling you between systematized and productized, you can make money while you sleep. And uh, so lawyers having to work, uh, having to, 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 the, only to bill it, the only way to collect eight hours of work is to work eight hours. And then you have to, uh, you, have, you have to bill it, you have to uh, collect it. Richard's pointing out that there's a, a realm of solutions that you can build it, and then you wake up the next morning and people have inserted money in the kiosk on the internet paying you for your intellectual uh, property. And uh, we see many examples of this coming into uh, place. Uh, here with uh, some of the major firms in, in, in the consumer market, places like LegalZoom, uh, kind of embracing uh, this approach. But if we're going to do systematized and package, it's much more interdisciplinary. We need things like uh, uh, the human capital we need is information technology, systems engineering, finance. Why? Because we have to pay a bunch of people to build it. Uh, first, and so it becomes capital intensive. We have to do marketing because we don't make our money on the first unit. We, we start to make uh, large margins on our 50th, and 60th, and 80th, and 100th, and maybe 200th uh, uh, unit. Uh, project management because the client is switching the risk and cost over onto us uh, and away from uh, them. And of course, you need law. And so you can see to, to go down this thing, law becomes a multidisciplinary. Uh, uh, profession. And so uh, I used to use the word lawyers, and now more and more I think the future of law is, uh, is legal professionals, of which a subset of those people are going to have uh, law licenses. But the, the, we're going to have the floor and fauna of legal professionals are going to be uh, expanded uh, greatly. And I'll, I'll, I'll be getting into that for quite a bit. So I want to just do uh, a couple of definitional things here. I, I, the, the view that kind of the starter kit for, for a law becoming multidisciplinary, uh, we use the, I've used this, the, the, the idea of a T-shaped professional. <coughs> T-shaped professionals comes from engineering from about 40 years ago with the idea uh, that there's some substantive area that you have a deep knowledge with and you need to know about uh, these other disciplines in order to collaborate effectively in a multidisciplinary team. And if you're a T-shaped legal professional, your STEM is law and you have data process design uh, 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 business operations, uh, uh, technology, etc. across the uh, top. This is very conceptual. Uh, all right. Uh, I want you to see. So now I know Cat Moon is coming. Cat Moon is going to come. She's going to introduce the competency model, the Delta model. The Delta model is way better than the T-shaped legal professional one. Here, I want you to tell her that. Tell her it came out of my mouth that the competency model that you should be using is the Delta model. It's been published on Legal Evolution. I've totally embraced it. Uh, but but the, the key thing is here is we're salting in these other disciplines. The Delta model is. Legal on one side, uh, uh, operation principles, which is the top of the T, and then interpersonal effectiveness. Because we're going to be working in teams together, we have to learn how to communicate and listen better. That's it. And so Kat is totally uh, correct on that here. So, so this is two of the three sides of the Delta uh, model. So uh, uh, I also want to make sure that I, I, I do not, uh, 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 this talk is, is, is uh, 
it really has to do with, with practice innovation. It doesn't deal with a uh, substantive uh, law, and I want to make sure that I don't uh, I give proper due to, to, to what the doctrinal faculty are doing and what practice, uh, what, what, what practice specialists are doing, because oftentimes they don't really understand what I'm talking about uh, here, and I want to just explain that cleavage. So, uh, so you can see the lifetime of a practice area uh, going from like synthetic biology was we had to wait for the technology to come into being here before we confronted the legal problems and the legal problems are complex and we need uh, uh, people like somebody like Jason would be what would be probably on the cutting edge of something uh, like uh, this to think through some of the implications. Uh, and then in a growth area like virtual reality, we have incorporated more and more into, in, into products and we're thinking through those legal industries and uh, those, those legal issues and what practicers. We have a, there's several firms now that have built practice series in virtual uh, reality and they're, and they're dealing with the subset of law issues. And then you get into things like uh, uh, mature industries like security, very complex. Uh, but we have, but we have a, a, an absolute uh, ton of, uh, of, uh, of know-how in the securities law area, and, and to a certain extent, we want to routinize it. We want to make it more uh, routine, and then ultimately, things like debt collection would be uh, very uh, uh, saturated and, 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 uh, and, and routinized. It's kind of difficult to make a, a, a living there because it's been more commoditized. Uh, the stuff that I'm talking about uh, it, it kind of maps onto uh, this. Where type, what I call type zero innovation is on the front end, that is, that is innovating solutions to law. And type, type zero is on the front end, and type one is, on the, is practice innovations. And the reason I have type zero and type one is lawyers, they, they, sometimes they say lawyers aren't innovative. That's complete BS. Uh, lawyers are extremely innovative in crafting these novel legal solutions to problems. The issues of virtual reality, synthetic biology, those lawyers are solving it in real time every single day. The idea of scaling it, uh, we haven't been taught how to scale. We haven't been, we haven't been immersed in the interdisciplinary uh, teams, and so that is more foreign to lawyers. My talk is about type one innovation, not type zero. But I want to give type zero innovation it's, uh, it's due. So type zero innovation, what I call adapting law to fit new social, political, and economic uh, complexities. That's what lawyers do on our best day. Uh, and type one is improving the quality, cost, and delivery of existing legal solutions because we want to drive up quality, we want to drive down creative costs so it, so it helps society. Yes, Jason. Can you move the mic down about three inches at a time? <laughs> Okay, I was wondering if somebody was going to help me with that air. I was going to plow through here. Is that better? <coughs> so the feedback isn't quite as ugly. So, so mapping on those two things, type one is across the top. Type zero is the deep uh, vertical. Does that make sense? Fine. Right. Okay. All right. So uh, in, uh, in, in terms of volume stuff, that cutting edge stuff, there's not a lot of it, but it pays really well by the hour. There's a ton of the... Uh, of the recurring stuff, and more and more of what we're encountering here is that there's volume stuff, and we want to apply systems to it so we can do it very, very cheaply and to kind of hold our powder so that we can deal with these complex issues that still need to be bespoke. Bespoke learning is not going away here, but we want to apply it uh, in its right uh, uh, quantum. Okay. All right. So the structure of the uh, uh, of the uh, market. Now I want to go and I want to point the lens. At the at structure of the market. There's, a, there's some famous studies. I'm going to move it down here a little bit uh, there's, 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 there's two studies, Chicago Lawyers 1 or Chicago's Lawyers 2 study, that are law professor famous uh, studies. If you're, uh, uh, many law professors know about the Chicago Lawyer 1 and 2 studies. And the first study was done in 1975. The example was drawn in the Chicago metropolitan area. A representative sample of roughly 800 uh, lawyers, and the big find in the Chicago Lawyers One study, which was done by the American Bar Foundation in Chicago, was if you want to understand the structure of the bar, find out who the lawyer's client is. And half the bar was serving people, and half the bar was serving uh, uh, you know organizational clients, and they were stratified by race, by religion, by where you went to law school, by bar associations, by uh, uh, residential zip codes. Uh, so kind of the, the, the people that went to fancy schools and were type 2 Protestants tended to serve the organizations. And the Jews and the Catholics 
there weren't very many women at the time here who were, 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 were shunted and serving the individual uh, market. They replicated the study in 1995, and, uh, and one, the good news was is that, that because the organizational uh, uh, clients were, were growing so rapidly, it began to diversify, it, and people from non-elite schools started getting opportunities to work for organizational uh, uh, clients. In-house practice exploded and became uh, a thing. But actually, we, we began to see evidence that it was becoming harder to serve individual uh, clients. And so, uh, and so uh, it, 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 it was the two hemisphere theory in 1975 for the Chicago Lawyers won. Uh, by, by uh, 1995, when they redid this study, you couldn't really call it hemisphere as a cap anymore. It was still segmented, but it was no longer. <laughs> that cleavage is very, very important. Is the lawyer serving individuals, or are they serving the organizational uh, uh, clients? And so, uh, uh, to bring us up a little bit closer to the present day, this is a distribution of starting salaries from uh, from the class of 2006, so roughly uh, 15 years ago. And I, uh, I, I actually, uh, this really helped my career when I was at the ABA annual meeting and uh, Jim uh, Leipold, who is the executive director of NALP, which is the organization that collects data on entry level salaries, he, uh, he, uh, he, he circulated this bimodal distribution, it's two modes. It's a, it's, uh, the mode is the most frequently occurring thing in a histogram. And uh, when you have two modes, something is like uh, almost everything in life is normally distributed. When you have two modes, two frequently, two, two evidences of kind of clustering of outcomes, uh, something uh, unusual is going uh, on. And so Greg Malkin, who's a very famous professor at Harvard uh, University, uh, served on the economic, uh, President's Economic Advisors thing, uh, he, he looked at this, he saw my blog post on it, he goes, hmm, why, I always knew that the legal profession was segmented, uh, but he said, uh, uh, I always knew that the law had different career tracks with varying levels of income, but I never realized how striking the pattern was, because uh, over here, uh, folks, that these are uh, law graduates that are going to work for firms that are serving organizational plans, they're making a high living, not a lot of real estate here, and then a bunch of people making forty to $60,000 a year. So this has been going on for this 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 this, this emergence of, uh, of the, the cleavage between the two markets has been going on. You know, it was noticed in 1975. It started to get more pronounced by 1995. Greg Malkin gets his attention. So, wow, something's going on here. This is the most recent uh, now uh, thing here, where the the, the the salaries continue to kind of go out to the uh, uh, to the right here. My best explanation for that is law when you're serving, when you're serving, you know, complex work for big organizational clients. It's what's called a like credence good. Like how do I know if I'm getting value? Well, do the workers that do it go to elite schools? And if they went to elite schools, that's our proxy for quality because we have a hard time measuring uh, quality. So businesses are getting bigger, there's more at stake, they're gonna throw money at those class of problems. But you see the broader legal profession experience a much different fate here because uh, because uh, ordinary consumers can't just kind of go out and buy the best here. Uh, they just want something that, that will solve their problem and they're getting priced out. And so we've got this, uh, this, 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 this very difficult problem going on in the profession. So here's data that comes from the Census Bureau and you can see it used to be half of the uh, market was serving individuals, half of it was serving organizational clients. Now it's $304 is being uh, legal service being purchased by a business. And only one quarter, and we're, we've got we become a much bigger country <laughs> with 325 million people, and, and only a small fraction of it is being used for our wills and our and our purchases of our homes and and uh, just life events, you know, uh, sickness, old age, estate planning, things like uh, uh, that. And actually, uh, the the Census Bureau breaks down. Uh, uh, they do a wonderful job of classifying economic activities and in the legal services they actually break it down like what's your class of customer and they break it down by individuals versus businesses and you can see between 2007 and 2012 the most recent data we have you can see that orange segment shrinking this is basically saying we used to we used to have 29 percent of the legal services being bought by individuals now it's going on to 24 percent and this is an absolute drop and, and money that's being uh, conveyed for uh, for uh, to buy legal uh, services. I mean, this is a shrinking of the market. This isn't like them falling behind. Us. This is an absolute shrinkage of dollars uh, being spent for personal services. So this is this is this. I am alarmed by it. Uh, I, I find that when I saw it, I was found this very very jarring. 
Uh, so there's a company called Clio out there. They do practice man cloud-based practice management software. So if I'm a, if I'm an Iowa lawyer and I serve the uh, you know I'm in the middle of the state and I'm serving uh, people in my county here and I and I do just general practice and maybe I have a business or two I service but mostly individuals. Uh, 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 I can subscribe to Clio and they give me all sorts of fancy software to enable me to to do my practice better. The advantage of this is that all this this billing data and subject matter data gets uploaded to the cloud here and it can be counted by Clio. And Clio employs data scientists to basically say what's in their data sample. And in this, their data sample, which covers a million matters, 10, almost 11 million hours, and $2.5 billion in, in deliverables, the good news is the average hourly rate for these practitioners is 260 bucks an hour. Well, that's a pretty decent rate. Uh, but then it gets a little bit more tricky. They're only working 2.3 hours a day doing actual legal billing. <coughs> of that 2.3 hours, they're only comfortable billing at 1.9, maybe because they know that the client may, uh, may object to, uh, to, to the higher bill. And once they send the bill, they're only getting 1.6 actually paid. And if you, and if you, if you multiply that out, that's $422 per day per lawyer fee earn, which is a little over 100 grand if you're, if you're lucky enough to bill uh, you know, do it, do it all, almost every day of the year. Well, I can pay my malpractice insurance, my health insurance, uh, a bunch of things to enable my practice, and you can see that that's increased stressful living. These folks are spending almost as time looking for legal work to do as they are actually doing it. And there, and there's the, there are viable legal claims out there that that, that, that uh, it's just not worth a candle to take them on here. So they're looking for 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 for, for fee paying work here that's actually worth their time to undertake it. Yes, Jason? Just take it off. There we go. Yeah, you don't wear a mic when you teach in here, do you? No, I don't. Okay. You guys following me so far? Does that yeah. make sense? Okay. So, uh, uh, so uh, this is a, a report that comes from the National Conference of State Courts. This is Warren Berger's organization that he helped found. Oh, uh, uh, about 50 uh, years ago. This is not a this is not an ideological group at all. And they ran ran this landscape report where they took 10 representative counties, big urban counties, and they tried to understand uh, the dockets and kind of harmonize it to build a big uh, a national data set. And this was a, basically a million cases that resolved uh, over the course of a year in these 10 big counties. Like we're talking about Harris County, which is Houston. San Jose County, Cleveland, Cook County, I think Miami-Dade is in there. Uh, there's a couple of East Coast things. There's 10 different jurisdictions. And what they found out was the median judgment, the non-zero judgment, and so if, it, if, it, the, the, if the case resolved with a judgment, the median judgment, which was about a quarter of a million of them, if it resolved with a judgment, uh, a monetary judgment, it was 2,400 bucks, that's the median. The average was about fifty, what, fifty-four hundred dollars, which is telling you when the median and the average depart from one another that much, it's telling you there's a few cases over here that are worth a lot that are driving up the average, but the median one, the fifty percentile, is twenty-four hundred bucks, and three out of every four cases has a self-represented litigant out here. Now this is really, really, this is the, this, these are shocking statistics. Uh, uh, first of all, twenty-four hundred dollars is not enough to for for me to write a repeat pleading. Somebody else to the other side to write a responsive pleading, and then the judge take it up, and we show up to court here, uh, and, and I get a fraction of that to pay my fees. And these are these are cases that just uh, probably don't make sense to have adversarial proceedings. Right? And you see this because three out of four of them don't have a lawyer on on one or both uh, 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 sides. And so that the uh, the uh, the authors of this report. Uh, the picture of civil litigation that emerges from the landscape data set confirmed the long-standing criticism that the civil justice system takes too long and costs too much. And so this is very, very stressful stuff here. And you can see I just picked one jurisdiction uh, uh, here to look at, just look at the civil pleadings. And what we find out is civil pleadings are just, even though Illinois in this time period had a million more residents, civil pleadings are just falling off the cliff. Why? Because it's just like uh, there's just the, 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 the class of cases that can support an attorney uh, to bring them uh, and, and can justify his or her fees here is shrinking. And so we have the, we have this, and this is the place we go to resolve our problems uh, in a civil uh, society. So what's causing uh, these uh, these changes? 
So, uh, uh, and I'm going to stick in the consumer uh, market uh, first. By the way, the solution is one to many legal solutions. Okay, so that there's a there's a solution to this. This is where, where I'm headed. Uh, but let's just stick in the in the in the consumer market for a second here. The the, the bottom line in this graph is just the the, the consumer price index, and then the consumer price index, the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the 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 Bureau of Labor Statistics will break out. Uh, 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 different uh, industries, and so uh, uh, law is what's known as a uh, is an industry that's known as to, to be subject to a thing called cost disease. Cost disease is is, is basically highly human intensive activities uh, that employ expensive uh, specialized knowledge workers. And so, what so what are what are what are industries that are subject to cost disease? Uh, law, medicine, uh, higher ed. So we're two for here. Uh, in this building, uh, <laughs> government would be another uh, one here because uh, because what happens is is is, is, is technology uh, enabled and manufacturing enabled things become more you know look at the price of a phone look at the price of a of a, of a, of a computer look at the price of, of 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 a lot of things in our society it's going to close it's going down over a period of time here uh, but folks that don't necessarily are not are not having hugely forts of productivity so well. I have to have a cost of living raise. Well, uh, the factory became much more uh, became much more efficient in the last uh, uh, ten years or twenty years here. The law didn't become hardly any official law, but the lawyers, you know, and the and the, and the doctors and the professors bought their share of it. And so, uh, and so, what this means is is that over time, more and more of our paycheck gets allocated to healthcare, higher ed, and if the consumers go along, law. Uh, but what we find out is, is now this is how the, uh, and you can see that where uh, legal services, the orange line, uh, health care is this one, uh, 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 college tuition is a little bit higher than law. So if you look to see how the consumer pricing index is based, it's that basically they look at uh, pricing <laughs> habits and they see what does the typical consumer put in their basket over time. And, over, and every once in a while, every few years, they'll basically do a new census or new, uh, uh, a new investigation and say, wow. They're not, they don't have as many eggs as they used to have. They're, they, they look for substitution patterns, and, and they, they figure that people are making substitution patterns in a, in a wealth-enhancing uh, way. So they'll, they'll, they'll periodically adjust the consumption patterns, the weighting, so to speak, what's in the actual basket. And you can see, for a long period of time here, where legal services, uh, whereas uh, legal services uh, uh, it would be in the other goods and services, which is 3.2% of the basket, and a subset of that is legal services. If we go back and we look at the, uh, it, we play this forward for about 30 years, you can see the, the gray bars are, are in the CPI, the green bars are the cost of legal services, and the orange line is basically showing that, 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 that law is losing market share. Like, healthcare's going up, uh, I, 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 tuition is going up here, I don't think I have enough money to buy legal services, so I go with that. And so they're basically just saying they're just going to the store. They're like, I just can't afford legal service. I got to make trade-offs. I uh, <laughs> buy healthcare. I'll buy uh, uh, higher ed. Nah, I just can't afford more legal. So, uh, and you can see that it goes from about fifty cents out of every hundred to a quarter. And so th this is very, very troubling. And you can see, well, what's taking its place? Well, things like legal Zoom have come into existence, which is a publisher, an expert system. Uh, by the way, I plan my estate with legal Zoom. You know, I'm comfortable saying that because I'm the simplest case. If I die, my wife gets everything. If my wife dies, I get everything. We both, if the plane lands in the Atlantic on our way to Europe, my daughter gets everything. And that can be handled by an expert <laughs> system, 299 bucks all in, and, and, uh, and, 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 uh, and it handled the, uh, the state here. It took me a while, I actually wrote about this. It took me a while to get comfortable with it. It's just like, I gotta pull the trigger here because I used to work with a bunch of blue collar workers and this is what they would use. And this is, a, in good conscience, this is what I would recommend that they use. But you can see that, that LegalZoom climbing up the value chain because we have trademarks and intellectual property and, 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 and a lot of things that are, being, that are coming into existence here that LegalZoom is, is starting to handle here. Now, they're tapping into a late market because, to a certain extent, the substitute for LegalZoom is nothing. Because, because a lot of these class of cases just can't be cost-effectively provisioned by a classically trained, bespoke uh, lawyer. Uh, the, uh, uh, just isn't going to happen. So, so that's the consumer uh, uh, market, and I'll come back to that in a second here. But uh, am I doing okay on time? I think I'm doing okay on time here. 
uh, I want to talk about the organizational clients because uh, the, 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 the the stresses uh, that are in, pl in play serving organizational clients are different. They're, 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 they're almost as extreme, but they're different and they're leading to changes in how legal services are provisioned. And the way I kind of think about it is just take an X, Y axis, legal complexity along the uh, vertical axis and, and economic growth around the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the horizontal axis. Society grows economically. We get we it gets becomes more legally uh, complex. This is just a very simple stylized uh, model. And if it's a straight line, if that relationship is just a straight line, we just need to hire more lawyers, rent more office space, hire more lawyers. If the world's getting more legally complex as we're growing economically. Just hire more lawyers. Uh, but if in fact that relationship has got a bend in it, which I believe uh, that it does. Uh, 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 that, uh, eventually, there's some sort of substitution effect. There's going to be pressure to begin substituting uh, here because because for every unit of economic economic growth, we're getting more units of legal complexity. Unless we can provision it, we can come up with a better way to do it more productively. Here, it's going to claw more wallet share from the consumer. And so, uh, and so, uh, the way we dealt with this in, in the first half of the 20th century is we just had the rise of law firms and the rise of of, of, of legal specializations. And law firms became teams of legal specialists. I'll handle the, uh, the, the, the corporate formation documents, you'll handle the tax, you'll handle the labor, employment, et cetera, uh, et cetera. And it worked wonderfully. But we're now in a period, well, then we went to a period where, where to, to access more economic opportunity became so complex and the folks that had this expertise to do this higher stakes work uh, were limited, it led to about 30 years of the law firms basically just being gushing with money. The, mo the money was just kind of gushing in here uh, because they wanted to hire the best to do this fairly sophisticated legal work. There was a lot of economic opportunity, so large, large law firms benefited and they levered up and they hired and it led to a boom of hiring of associates. But we're now in a period going forward where there's going to be a, a substitutions, and we see this stress building where there's a real pressure for substitution, not just for cost, but for quality. Because these things, these things are getting so complex that the teams of humans that are not tech enabled will make mistakes. Uh, and the, 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 the quantum of complexity is just going up so much that we're, we're being pushed into, into new practice, new ways of provision legal services. This is part of what's driving uh, artificial in, intelligence. And so uh, the way I think about it is everything to the left, everything in the past, we handled with specialization. Everything in the, in the future, almost everything in the future, at least for type one innovation, is going to be data process and technology uh, plus law. Well, in most law schools, we just teach you law. We don't teach you data process and technology. And, and I don't think it's going to be the, the, the lawyers who we, we give you these classes. It's going to be us lawyers who just have enough knowledge across the T here to collaborate with the data scientists, with the process experts, with the accounting folks here. We're going to have multidisciplinary uh, uh, teams here. But it means that we're going to have to invite in and treat as peers people from other parts of the university. So, uh, so uh, as evidence that this is happening, uh, this is a chart that shows in-house uh, lawyers versus government lawyers versus law firms. And you can see since uh, 1997, which is the year that the Census Bureau uh, gave us a clean standard definition for, uh, uh, for these uh, different uh, practice areas or different areas, uh, segments of the legal economy, you can see law firms are growing the slowest. Government's growing faster in the number of lawyers than, uh, than, uh, than, than, than uh, uh, law firms. And law firms are what, uh, hiring out of law school is what make legal education. That, that's the economic edge. That's what rationalizes. That's what justifies your time and your tuition dollars. It's the money that comes from uh, in-house, or from, from, uh, from law firms. And then in-house, which generally doesn't hire out of law school. Look at that growth. 35,000 in 1935, now up to about 108,000. There's more lawyers working in-house today than there are in the AMLAW 200 working domestically, and they don't hire out of law school. As a matter of fact, they even say in their engagement letters with their law firms, don't put any first and second years on my matters, because we don't think that they're worth, uh, that we, with their high salaries, we don't think that they're worth it. This has had enormous consequences for legal uh, education. Uh, I just want to highlight that, that uh, I teach professional responsibility in Indiana, and I, I want to just point out that we, 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 we lack schema to, to, to think about really what's happening here. Uh, we know we, when, we, when we have professional responsibility, we talk about our relationship with the client. The client is almost always somebody with a pulse. Uh, occasionally, we'll have a business owner, 
And if we have a business owner or the general counsel, we begin to think about organizational clients. And we think about, uh, well, when dealing with a business here, I have different ethical responsibilities. But when we, if, but I created this typology based upon what I was seeing in the field here. And as we move along here, we see basically law firms embedded inside businesses. They're insourcing a non-core function. And if you go to uh, the top 50 corporations, especially things like tech, finance, insurance, they, they, they have a thousand lawyers working in some of those legal departments. And they don't hire out of law school. And, uh, and, and, uh, and, and they're very, very sophisticated. And these legal ops people are ones that are basically, they're developing the one-to-many. They're the ones that are really leading the charge for the one-to-many solutions. Because these corporations say, hey, we have a limited amount of money that we can spend out here. How can we stretch our budget? And, and the step one is quit hiring these expensive law firms. Step two, let's stretch our legal budget. Let's hire legal ops uh, folks. And you see the, the innovation in the, in the legal profession these days here. Uh, it's most intense and really big uh, legal departments that have legal ops folks. So, so uh, and look at uh, is, is other evidence that there's something big is going on here. Look at all these legal tech startups. I mean, just astonishing. Every year this gets updated by Thomson Reuters here, and, uh, and almost all of them, there's some lawyer that had experience and said, I think I could do this more efficiently with some technology, with some process. Uh, the, it looks very impressive. The reality, though, is that many, many, many of these companies struggle to get market purchase because their, their, pro their products are fairly complex and it takes a long time to educate and sell. And so, so, so it, this is a this field here is very, very. Uh, these these are true believers that left their practice to start these uh, uh, these uh, companies. They, if they're lucky, their company will get sold to a bigger fish. And uh, we'll eventually get a roll up. This is like uh, this is like Detroit in 1905, where there was 150 car manufacturers. They're all right that the automobile is going to be the future of America. They're wrong. It's going to be their car, uh, and it's going to get rolled up into basically what eventually became the big three. It was the big four, and then it was the the, the big three uh, uh, now. And so this is what happens when an industry gets uh, gets uh, uh, gets uh, more. Uh, uh, mature, but these are these are fascinating and and, and, and definitely the, the shows us where the future is uh, is uh, headed. But kind of bringing it back to the law school, you can see the uh, that uh, this is the the graph that shows entry level hiring in private practice by different types of firms. And and, and I think that my colleagues in the, in the faculty oftentimes think, well, we had the recession; it'll bounce back. It's cyclical. Uh, uh, the high, it's 2007, the, the number of jobs of people going into law firms, and you can see it shrunk every year for 12 years. So something is causing this backup. I think that what's causing this backup is the fact that, we, that we, we've been reluctant to, uh, to, 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 to embrace and begin to plan for and build the infrastructure for one-to-many legal solutions. Because, because one group, uh, the, the law firms aren't providing what the big clients need, and the, and the ordinary citizens can't afford what the law firms are, or, or what, the, what the lawyers are providing. And so we, act, we, we, we've, we've effectively, because of our lack of productivity enhancement, uh, we're, 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 we're suffering demand side consequences that are, that, are, that are formidable. And actually, I very much think that this is related to what's going on in our broader uh, society, because, because lawyers, we haven't thought about serving people. <laughs> And we thought about earning a living. And, uh, and we are paying a price. This is part of the political dynamic in this country now. And you can see just what I described here, the logical consequence would be law school uh, uh, applications or enrollments just fall off a cliff. We have as many law school applicants as we had 40 uh, years ago. So these are big structural uh, changes that are taking place. So the multidisciplinary legal uh, uh, professionals this is a fairly complicated diagram, but I think I've given you enough framework to understand what I'm talking about uh, here. Is uh, uh, These are my clients, people, uh, uh, business with no GC, business with a solo GC, uh, uh, the legal department, a publicly held one, and then a Fortune 500 with the big legal ops department. And here's my view of legal professionals along the top where familiar lawyers and shareholders with counsel and associates and staff attorneys, but then paralegals, finance, uh, recruiting, and professional development, uh, 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 marketing, business development, client experience, uh, process, uh, sourcing, accounting, software engineers, and data scientists. And I, and I have this uh, kind of fuzzy area over here because the reality is, is that uh, because of the ethics rules that keep 
uh, uh, lawyers from co-venturing with, uh, with, with, with non-lawyers, that's the term of art in the rules, but I call them allied professionals, uh, 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 that portion of the market here is not experiencing dramatic innovation because, because the, the, it's capital constraint. Over on the right side, it's less capital constraint because uh, the way the, the, these rules have been interpreted uh, uh, by uh, bar associations is, is that, uh, is that if, if I'm one of those point solutions, those, that, that, that those, those legal tech companies that I showed you before here, uh, I, I'm not practicing law if I'm selling my work product to a lawyer that supervises my work. It's kind of everything that, everything that comes from that ecosystem is treated as almost like a paraprofessional where the person, as long as the person who's buying it has got a law license, uh, uh, that the rule 5.4 fee splitting won't apply. And uh, so which means that three out of every four dollars is not subject to this uh, fee splitting uh, rule, which is uh, so which has led to tremendous, which has led to that huge rise of that ecosystem. But access to justice is, is taking place over here, and the and the and the and the, and the lawyer to consumer business here really dramatically affects what's uh, happening. So I want to uh, I want to uh, stop here in just a second, but I, I want to bring it back to my three people I started with, Jason, uh, uh, Alma, and Eric. To solve any of these problems, you need to become what's called a minimal viable lawyer. And, uh, and, 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 and I'll just tell you the story of these three people. Jason is the head of, uh, of, 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 of innovation at Microsoft. He started his career about uh, 15 years ago in a big firm on the West Coast. Before he went to law school, he spent five years as a, as a software engineer. He went to MIT, undergrad firms here. And one day, he's asked to do something, and he realizes, he goes back to the parties, you know, I can write a little script and I can automate all this. And he goes, no, no, we don't need you to do that, Jason. He says, no, I really, I can do it. It won't take me very long. He says, no, no, Jason, can you get back to work here? And he began to realize, as he began to push it, that there was no interest in efficiency at all in his organization. And he, and he realized, well, this isn't going to work for my professional. This, this, this isn't going to work for me. I don't want to be part of an industry that won't embrace efficiency, but I'm not, I don't know how to do a deal. And so he sucked it up and he spent two more years learning how to become a minimum viable lawyer, got hired by Microsoft, and now he's their explorer person that's basically thinking about, he's that type six client, and he's thinking about how do I do, and he's talking about interoperability and artificial intelligence and getting systems to talk with each other, and, and he's hiring cultural anthropologists to tell stories uh, to, so that he can get change management in his legal department. I mean, this guy, uh, but he couldn't do none of this until he was the minimum viable lawyer. Uh, and then there's Alma Assay, who came from a working class uh, background, got into NYU Law School. <coughs> she knew one lawyer uh, growing up here was her uncle, and he did, he did something like an entertainment law here. And so and she ends up doing well in law school. She gets hired by this fancy firm, Gibson Dunn, here. And she gets assigned to this guy who does entertainment law at Gibson uh, Dunn. Well, he does entertainment litigation. So she's, she's basically doing high-end litigation for him. And, uh, and she doesn't really know anything about the legal uh, industry, but she knows that she wants to do good work, and uh, and so uh, and she and she's working hard for this partner, and she sees that he's not very organized, and so she begins to build binders and spreadsheets to basically be able to find stuff, and she and, and, and she becomes so indispensable that this guy will not take any litigation case without Alma on it, and Alma is beginning to think to herself, you know what, why why. Why am I indispensable with my Excel spreadsheets and my binders here? Why isn't there a better solution to this practice management thing? So she left and she started a company called Allegory. A wonderful story. She eventually she was there for about five years, sold it to a company like Integrion, and uh, and she was a minimum viable lawyer. She was able to see this oper uh, opportunity. And uh, my third example is Eric Wood. Eric Wood is uh, started his career in New York. Ends up in, 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 in a big Wall Street firm, and ends up in Chicago at a firm that, in Chapman Cutler that does financial services stuff here. And a couple of times that he's in Cleary, and he's a big fantasy basketball fan. And, uh, and, and he scrapes the uh, internet for this sports data so that, uh, so that he could basically would be more expert at fantasy basketball because you can't be very good unless you data mine. And so he taught himself coding so he could data mine, so he could totally <laughs> kill it in fantasy basketball. Well, he's, he's working late in New York one day, and he realizes the work I'm doing at 2 in the morning uh, could be automated. I know it can be automated here, and I resent this, and I don't want to do this forever. Uh, and so he ends up at Chapman Cutler. He sees a similar pattern, and he makes a, an appointment with the, uh, uh, the chief executive partner, and he says, uh, 
I think I'm going to go into legal tech because you know there's just a lot of opportunity. It's just obvious here that there's a lot of innovation. He, he would about he was about to become one of those point solutions, and, uh, and the manager person says, "Stop!" Took him off the billable hour. Uh, 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 made him a, the chief technology associate. He never billed any hours for the next five years. He became an equity partner, and in his first uh, like two months at Chapman and Cutler, automated a whole bunch of things that the firm was no longer getting paid for, saving 1.5 million dollars. Just like yeah, that's how that's how low the fruit is. It's just hanging this low off the ground uh, here. But you've got to be a minimally viable lawyer with these other interdisciplinary skills. And so Alma had the courage to go teach herself. She was fearless. Jason had some of it from his uh, prior experience. He picked up his along the way uh, through his fantasy basketball stuff. But this is very hard. So all these people, uh, if they stayed in the law firm, could have been selling their time for about 800 bucks an hour. And the idea that the law firm is going to uh, is going to forego $800 an hour of their time here to have them build something that might be two or three years if it pays off. These are very risky decisions here, and the law firms struggle to, 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 to deploy this very expensive, it took us a million dollars to build them, uh, to deploy them to do one to many solutions, it's gonna be another two or three million dollars here. How do I know the client is gonna buy us to do it? So we've got a huge potential for stranded costs here and a huge reluctance uh, to do this one. So I wanna uh, show you, uh, I'm gonna stop for questions here in a second, uh, but, uh, uh, but, um, in the healthcare industry, we all know that healthcare is too expensive. But let's face it here, uh, the health hospitals have pretty good solutions these days here. I have a surgery here, here, both of my wrists and my shoulder. Uh, I'm 57 years old here. My body feels pretty good here, but it was wearing out here, and they went and they, they fixed it. It was all covered by uh, insurance. Uh, so in the healthcare industry, one in ten, uh, fewer than one in 10 healthcare workers have a medical uh, degree here. It's a, an MD or a DO. And look at all the ones that have master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, associate's degrees, or high school degrees here. And you can see that, the, 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 that only these two have professional or graduate degrees. These have bachelor's degrees. And this big swath here is vocational education. And this is the beginnings of a one to many system that allow you to drive up quality and drive down per unit cost. What do you think the same statistic is in, 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 in legal? What is it? So, how many allied professionals? This is like, a, what, what is, what's the statistic? I got this in the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What do you think? What is it? Take a guess. It's shocking, but I'll take a guess. Just, just take a guess here. Seven. What's that? Seven in ten. Seven in ten? Jason, right? Yeah, seven in ten. Right, so, seventy percent of the profession is it got a law degree, and the other third, it's actually four and five. So, so the and and and, 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 and to qualify this. Uh, these are healthcare workers. This isn't the accountant and the general counsel. These are people that are basically inserted in to provide care. Uh, and this would count paralegals, legal assistants here. I think we need to, this is a huge challenge for uh, legal education. We want to go down this route and begin to build the credentialing systems uh, to, so that we can collaborate more effectively. So that's where I think that we're at here. I'm going to stop with questions. I know I've gone on too long here. So I want to uh, give a chance for you to tell me I'm all wrong. Kevin. So, Bill, the fact is in the medical context, though, yeah. all these people, a lot of these people are working in a t as a team, yeah. right? You know, yeah, yeah. there's some person you go in to see the nurse first and then the PA and then the yeah. doctor. Yeah. What, it feels like what we're trying to do in law, where we're headed is somewhere different than that. Like we're trying to solve the rural practice problem and so we're trying to train these legal technicians that will know how to do one thing, but they're not, I mean, I think we're, in, intending for them to work autonomous, autonomously to some degree, not necessarily part of the law, is right? The, 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 Kevin, it's, 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 it's interesting you say, I don't disagree with that. The idea would be to solve the rural practice problem here. I think it's an issue of scale. How do I drive up quality and drive down per unit cost? We need to build a system uh, to solve that particular problem. The idea that we can do it through offering a few classes to students here, I think we're underthinking the nature of these because these these are healthcare systems. Uh, it's not a perfect analogy with, with with healthcare, but the idea would be that the lawyer that we cling to our autonomy and nobody can do what we do here. We so often see that when we we look back in history and we can see that the the great storefront revolution where 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 we tried to make a, a 
commoditize legal services. It failed because of the 5.4 rule and the fact that lawyers resented the fact that they were reduced to salesmen and that the people that were doing the real work were the secretaries in the back office. This, this all happened about 40 years ago. And, uh, and, and, and we had, I don't think we learned the right lessons from it. So. Yes, sir. Um, so, thinking about you know again this model, similar to Kevin's question, um, you talked about you know your examples where the minimum viable lawyer yeah. who then learns to do some of these, yeah. he learns to code, yeah. learns to do other things. You know, the doctor here is not learning how to run the X-ray machine. That, Somebody that, that, else that, is training. They're learning yeah. how to use yeah. that improvement. Yeah. So, what about a model where the lawyer is hiring a coder or so the, hiring someone to scrape that? I guess what I would, uh, I would say is, is we need to evolve into a system. Would we agree on that? Uh, yeah. We're going to evolve into a system. And I almost uh, uh, put a picture out here of the, kind of the doctor who makes house calls. I think I'm, I got some aspirin. You know, I got some band-aids here. They worked in you know, how much could they really do when they were making uh, house calls. You know, we, we have to start with a doctor and build concentric circles <coughs> around them so that eventually it evolves into a system that looks obvious, but it's so complex it had to evolve over a period of a century. Uh, I think we need to go on that journey here, and we're going to start with a lawyer. We're going to break these things into pieces and parts. I think the idea of a grand solution, a grand system, is too complex. We can get it wrong the first thing. We have to start, we have to iterate from really small bites. And, uh, uh, I have one, I have other slides in here, but one thing, if we're going to start with lawyers, uh, this would be uh, kind of a prototype uh, solution here. Uh, I, 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 when you start your legal career here, nobody wants to pay you a lot of money to do very much. So your time is cheap. As a matter of fact, you're doling over uh, uh, cash to, 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 to Dean Washburn uh, to get educated here. So you're, you're, you're worth so little that you're paying us. Uh, as opposed to we paying you uh, here. And so it's really good time to learn some new uh, stuff here. The way I kind of think about it is, is because I think that this is too big a cultural shift to expect the faculty to solve it with our existing paradigm. And I think the idea would be to build some, some, some of this. And all these competencies we're talking about, remind me of your first name? David. David. David, you made an acute observation. All the people that are building the system have less credentials. Right, and so that and so and, and so, uh, what we really want to do is we want the lawyers to practice at the top of their uh, license. And everything that I might teach a student uh, as they're on their journey to become a minimally uh, a, a, a viable lawyer, it would be 300 level difficulty things here. A little bit about design, a little bit about business operations, a little bit because the, the reality is, as they move into their career here, they become too expensive to train, and then they become obstacles to building the systems. They, they become as what. Uh, Sometimes it's called educated incapacity. They've been so socialized in their existing paradigm, they can't pull back and realize the system would solve this much uh, better. So I, I think about uh, uh, field placements in the third year. I think about right after the bar exam where people are looking for jobs here. Uh, we can make a huge amount of difference with basically two or three or four weeks worth of training here. I think that's the first cut. Right before we onboard new associates. When you get into mid-career professional stuff here, <coughs> People's time is too expensive. Somebody's paying them two or three hundred dollars an hour, fully loaded here. It's very expensive to train them, and if you do train them, that education better be extremely well engineered because they have zero tolerance for you wasting their time. So this is the this is a, I guess where I need to uh, uh, to uh, leave it here. The, the human capital challenge because this isn't about educating just law students. This is about up upskilling the whole profession so that we can we can better serve our responsibilities to ordinary people and uh, and uh, and uh, and civil society. Law has to work for our society, uh, and and, uh, and and we have to make a living derivative of that. So often, I think we're thinking about earning a living as ah, and, and 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 our obligation to society is something we think about like on Sunday. I, I think it needs to be reversed uh, uh, here. We need to think about you know building a system to better serve our society, and then from which we'll we'll enjoy uh, the next millennium of prosperity. Yes. Um, so I understand like what you're saying. You know, if you are in a legal practice, you're obviously going to gain skills. That you're in a market where you're learning the business yeah. as well, so then you can see where the problems are. Yeah. And so then is the solution, those people, you know, figure out systems and maybe like a lot of it is probably automized in technology. Yeah. And then later on, you know, people in a rural practice or smaller practice are able to adopt those things and become more efficient <clears throat> yeah. to drive down cost. Yeah. 
But I'm failing to see how that's going to drive down cost because it doesn't necessarily seem like a rural practice person's problem is necessarily that their cost of their practice is too much. Yes. It's just that it seems that, you know, there's not enough access for people because in order to, you know, make a living, you have to set your hourly rate at something. Yeah. And so it's like, well, okay, I'm, yeah. I'm only working 2.3 yeah. hours a day. Yeah. And maybe, you know, these efficiencies are going to make it so my 2.3 hours are able to be done in one hour now. Correct. Which yeah. is great. Yeah. I, but oh, yeah. then yeah. are you supposed to just expect yeah. Yeah. that yeah. a lot yeah. more people are yeah. going to come to you because now all of a sudden all I've done is I'm now billing less, and maybe there's the, still the amount of the small lack of people coming. So are you a faculty then, member here? Are you a student? I'm a student. That, that is the killer question. <laughs> you answered a killer question here. The, the, I, 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 I did have something on access to justice here. Just let me just breeze through this because you, you are so right. You're 100% you're, you're right here. The ABA, I don't know, Kevin, were you at the, the, the ABA mid-year meeting when resolution 1.15 1, 1, passed? There's a, there's a big to-do uh, that the, 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 the state bar associations should embrace uh, innovation and have regulatory experimentation. But my view is, just like your view, is we could change the ownership rules here. That's not going to instantly solve access to justice. And, you know, you're basically making practitioners more efficient, but they still won't solve the economic problem the consumer has of their inability to pay. So, uh, 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 so up in Canada, there's this thing called the Civil Resolution Tribunal that's moved toward online dispute uh, uh, resolution. It's the first government-sponsored uh, 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 online dispute resolution in North uh, America. I got to, I was lucky enough to find out about this thing and spend some time with the folks up there going back a few years uh, ago. And the basic idea was uh, they realized that there's a class of problems that are so uh, low stakes that the lawyers aren't taking it. So they have to redesign uh, the system. And, uh, uh, and so the, the basic idea would be there's a website, you log on to, you got a problem, you know you got a problem, you log on to it, and there's a self-diagnosis that's written at sixth grade level, and it's basically giving you some potential solutions here. A lot of this stuff is automated in this one. Then you go to party-to-party -party negotiations, which basically takes the ideas of like eBay or, uh, or, uh, or Amazon that have online marketplaces and they use those mediation technologies and again, a lot of that is automated. And then there's facilitated negotiation with the, with the decision prep because the online dispute resolution engineers the lawyers out of the process. And in the place of the lawyers comes a case manager. Uh, that presides over it if, 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 if it isn't resolved through this automated process right here and the uh, and the uh, and uh, then there's a case manager and they're and there's they're, they're hiring like gangbusters so this is a completely new field that didn't exist uh, uh, five years ago and they're hiring uh, they're hiring probably over a hundred case managers now for the CRT the CRT and then you, they will actually lead to a produced decision and they track <coughs> metrics uh, uh, with it, and they have and they have design principles to make it so that it works on your phone here. So they say our citizens in British Columbia for things that are under five thousand dollars and all automotive disputes and all strata disputes, which are condo disputes, are mandatory to go through this one. The presumption that you don't need a lawyer, and you can fill out the complaint in your pajamas in your kitchen on a smartphone, and it's sixth grade e easy. And this is a they had all sorts of user studies to make this thing work and then they run their, their statistics and 84% are likely to recommend the CRT to others. And remember there's a winner and a loser in disputes and with 84% to say use that because they're getting to resolution relatively uh, uh, quickly. This begins to solve access to justice but what does it do? It engineers the lawyers out. With three out of every four cases are self-represented and this is the idea that uh, of the uh, of, of re-engineering system. I, Law school should we should have courses to design systems like this. There should we we should have a field of study where people uh, identify dispute resolutions that have high quality uh, consumers. We study the end users and very low per unit cost. You know who built this system? PwC. Uh, you know, it's at the CRT, but it's so, uh, so uh, Shannon Salter, who, uh, who did the system, she said, everyone thought we were so tech savvy. You know what they were at the beginning? They were a website and an Excel spreadsheet. She said they were a Potomkin village. But, uh, but she iterated, to go to your point, uh, 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 the, uh, they just iterated over a period of, uh, of time uh, here. So I finished my slide deck. I'm happy to take any more questions if we have time. 
You had an, asked a great question. Did I answer your question, or you, you th are you a dis are you you disagree? No, I think you answered my question. I just think that the end result would just more so be that maybe there wouldn't be as many rural practitioners or people who are. I think the reality is you got to you could skip the online dispute resolution scales it to the rural counties in Iowa. Yeah. Maybe you would be the maybe maybe she's the new executive director for the uh, Iowa online dispute resolution thing here. We. Uh, 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 Iowa, or I mean, uh, Utah is going big on this. They have a Supreme Court justice that says he has no patience for access to justice. He says that we have to have a solution like now. And the bar in Utah is going along with it. It's been very, or, or this, is a, this is an encouraging period of time here. I think lawyers act slow, but when they act, they act right and they build great systems. So I'm, I'm optimistic that we're headed in the right direction. But we just, we're not the first into the chasm. But we're gonna build a great system. Yes. I don't know if you already answered this question. I came in a little late, uh, very late. Uh, but uh, so this technology automation, um, yeah. uh, it has been out there, but it is it depends on a lot of data, and it still doesn't have ha hasn't met that requirement of as many as much data to be analyzed yeah. to have those results ready. Yeah. Uh, to have an electronic judge right there at the you know civil yeah. resolution tribunal and be able to decide. This, this is this is the, the uh, I think I'm familiar with the technology you're talking about. That's not what the CRT is at all. Uh, this is the, this the, this is this is the, this is just basic mediation uh, principles. First of all, explain the problem to see if they can solve it themselves. If there's still a dispute here, uh, enter into a uh, offer. Uh, counter offer thing here that facilitates dispute. It's, it's, it's not uh, mining case law or anything like that here. It's to, to get people to, to resolve them on. And then you get a case manager who's familiar with the case law and educating the parties here. So it's a, it, it's a process driven one. It's not, it, there's, there's very little tech involved in this. It's mostly process, but process is an innovation. So it's process which, 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 which reduces the cost. Yes? The more we innovate, uh Similar to the medical field, yeah. when we get all these other individuals that don't have yeah. JDs or medical right. degrees, what used to be a, a partner and five associates yes. now becomes a partner, one associate, and three paralegals or legal assistants. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's one way to look at it. Yeah. So, but how do we deal with um, continuing enrollment in law schools and continuing uh, the lawyers and making sure that they have jobs instead of pushing them? In towards more of the paralegal or legal assistant. Uh, the, the, uh, some of the uh, lawyers just say, "How do we help this group of people that want to get a professional degree and earn a good living?" Here? I mean, that's the. I think that that's the. That's the gist of the question. I think that the, I, I'm going to fall back. Say, I don't know if I have an answer to that question, I, but I'm a licensed lawyer. I have an obligation to uh, to to uh, promote the rule of law and innovate the best interest of the public interest. And I think if I, me, and you are those problem solvers, if we if we co-build the system, uh, we'll be able to derivatively earn a living from it. And so, uh, I, and so this goes back to what I was talking about before here. Uh, our duty is to figure out this problem for our client, for broader society. Uh, we're well trained. We have the ability to learn uh, much better than the average uh, person here. We can collect data. We have to. We have to work together because we have to. Uh, because we have to actually have to go back to the minimum viable lawyer thing here. It's expensive to understand the problem. And then to build the system, we have to underwrite a group of us to build the system. We have to spread risk. And so uh, I think that the idea of, of, of providing a solution like you're signing these loan papers at the University of Iowa, how am I going to get an ROI? I don't have a quick answer for that, uh, but I'm talking about this broader issue. Let's, 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 let's work on this broader issue going on for society here, and I bet me and you, if we're working on the solution here, we'll both earn a decent living. That's the best I can, that's the best, that's, that's my honest answer. We are out of time, so let's thank uh,